Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with Professor Kumrul Haider of Fordham University, whose op-ed in an English-language Bangladeshi newspaper labeled nuclear the sixth horseman of the apocalypse and explained exactly why nuclear has such dangers in stunningly clear terms. Then we revisit Dr. Helen Caldicott, for her announcement of the upcoming Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, taking place, the Symposium, not the Extinction, February 28th and March 1st in New York City. Plus, we're going to have the ever-popular Numbnuts of the Week, activist shout-outs, a chance to talk directly to John Stewart, a very special new song for the holidays, and more nuclear information than Santa will ever put in Dick Cheney's stocking because it's too stuffed already with coal and recriminations. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, December 16, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Starting off in Japan this week, where since the December 10 implementation of the Japan Secrets Act, there has been a marked decrease in information coming out of that country, either for direct repression reasons or because people are self-censoring with a wait-and-see perspective. We do know that the Japan State Secret Protection Law, that's the official name, is now causing shutdowns of Fukushima Report websites. Japan's biggest blog service, called Amibro, is now shutting down those websites. These include whitefood.co.jp and amiblo.jp slash sekeno yutai. Any listeners in Japan, if you have updated information on any impact that the Secrets Act is having, please let me know through email at info at nuclearhotseat.com. According to Asahi Shinbun, the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Authority in Japan has signaled that there needs to be a massive release of tainted radioactive water to help decommission the Fukushima site. Well, you can't decommission that wreckage over there. All you can do is clean up the rubble and try to mitigate the ongoing disaster. But be that semantically as it may, the head of Japan's nuclear watchdog said that the contaminated radioactive water stored at Fukushima should be released into the ocean. That's what he said, should be released into the Pacific Ocean. Shinichi Tanaka, the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, made the comment December 12, after visiting the facility. He said, I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of tanks holding water tainted with radioactive substances. He obviously doesn't look at any of the Facebook nuclear sites, all of which have pictures of those tanks. Tanaka went on to say, We have to dispose of the water. We also have to obtain the consent of local residents in carrying out the work so we can somehow mitigate the increase in tainted water. Dude, you can't mitigate it because it continues to leak between 300,000 and 400,000 gallons per day. Tanaka concluded, We must do our utmost to satisfy residents of Fukushima. Then how about giving them the money to move away and get resettled and try to rebuild their lives where they're not in a radioactive danger zone? Then there's the issue of releasing radioactively contaminated water in large amounts into the Pacific. Right now, the leak that is happening is somewhere in the vicinity of an Olympic-sized swimming pool, Every 10 days, this is going to be much larger. And if you think it's not a danger, according to the Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority of Norway, in a report they published in 2003, way before Fukushima happened, they said, in deep oceans, 
Most plutonium remains in the water phase for a long time due to a slow mixing of water masses and slow sedimentation rates. The finest particles can easily be transported long distances. Plutonium. Coming soon to a west coast of North America beach near you. And Fukushima Governor Masao Uchibori on Tuesday told the Tokyo Metropolitan Government that the Tohoku Prefecture hopes to host some of the preliminary events for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics to showcase its recovery from the 2011 nuclear accident, presuming that there's any recovery to show at that point. Uchibori said, We need to set a goal so that we can show how much Fukushima has recovered. This is what he told reporters after holding talks with Tokyo Governor Yoichi Masuzoe. Hey guys, how about a preliminary event like soccer at night? You won't even have to light up the field because it will glow in the dark. If you have any other suggestions about preliminary events for the Olympics to be held in Fukushima, please put on your best sarcasm and send them to info at nuclearhotseat.com. The best ones will be read and attributed on a future program. This next story comes out of the University of California, Davis campus. Davis being a town which is environmentally conscious and has declared itself a nuclear-free zone more than a decade ago. However, at the edge of the UC Davis campus, about two miles outside the city, sits a contaminated ghost town of empty kennels, deserted research laboratories, and aging landfills surrounded by barbed wire. It is a secluded Department of Energy facility where UC Davis scientists fed beagles, beagle dogs, radioactive chow in a 30-year study of nuclear fallout. And the site is so toxic that it is proposed for listing as a federal Superfund site. The facility emits radiation and has contaminated groundwater. And oh, what it did to those dogs. From 1956 until 1986, when the last of the 1,200 beagles died, researchers at UC Davis were part of what they called the Beagle Club, a set of experiments in six states to study the effects of nuclear contamination. Scientists fed some of the beagles strontium-90, injected some with radium, and irradiated others with cobalt to see how nuclear fallout might affect people. Neighbors and former workers at the site may have been unknowingly exposed to radiation from a cobalt irradiator used on beagles outdoors for 15 years without public warning. Radioactive and chemical wastes from the facility have poisoned wells on neighboring farms. This research, sounds more like torture to me, was sponsored by the Atomic Energy Commission, a forerunner of the Department of Energy. In addition to UC Davis, other locations studied the effect of radiating beagles inside the womb, inhaled radioactive material, the effect of plutonium on beagles, external radiation, and long-term genetic damage. At UC Davis, the scientists' primary mission was to determine the danger of strontium-90, the bone-seeking isotope that is present in nuclear fallout. From before birth, To the time they reached adulthood, 300 beagles at UC Davis were fed a daily diet that included strontium-90. Other beagles were injected with radium to replicate the exposure early this century of women who developed bone cancer from painting radium dials on watches. Who were and are these Nazis to be so cavalier with life? The Department of Energy estimates that it will cost as much as $200 billion, that's billion with a B, over the next 30 years to clean up the toxic mess caused by half a century of what they label nuclear development. But sounds more like the torture and killing of dogs. Where was the ASPCA when we needed them? And I wonder if they could apply their methods to protecting people and the environment. Federal regulators have found a safety violation involving monitoring of workers for radiation exposure 
at the Palisades Nuclear Power Plant, which is located in Michigan on Lake Michigan, across from Chicago. A recently released report shows NRC inspectors examined 20 components at Palisades and found 10 safety violations. David Lockbaum, director of the Union of Concerned Scientists, said that it is alarming that the problems were found by the NRC inspectors and not first by Entergy workers. Lockbaum said, you have to do more than fix these violations. Adding that to prevent reoccurrences requires that Palisades operators get to the root of the problems. Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear went over the entire history of the problems at Palisades during last week's nuclear hot seat number 181. You might want to check it out. And at Zion Nuclear Power Station in Illinois, near Chicago, the decommissioning operation, which began on September 1st, will skip one of the slowest, dirtiest, and most costly parts of tearing down a nuclear facility, separating radioactive materials, which must go to a licensed dump, from non-radioactive materials, which can go to an ordinary industrial landfill. The new, new, new idea is not to bother sorting the two. Instead, anything that could include radioactive contamination will be treated as radioactive waste. That's like putting the recycling in with the garbage, letting it go to the dump, and who cares what happens after that. But no, that's not enough bad news, because now it's time for... Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. When is a plutonium-contaminated former nuclear weapons site not a plutonium-contaminated former nuclear weapons site. When Congress declares it's a national wildlife refuge. That's what happened to Rocky Flats, a U.S. nuclear weapons production facility near Denver, Colorado, that operated from 1952 to 1992. Weapons production ended in 1989, and operators of the plant later pleaded guilty to criminal violations of environmental law. The site is known to be contaminated with plutonium due to several fires that happened there and other inadvertent releases caused by wind at a waste storage area. Still, in 2000, Congress went, poof, you're no longer a toxic site, you are a wildlife refuge. And so it was. So now that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is in charge at the renamed Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, what are they planning to do? Conduct a prescribed burn to take out the invasive weeds. That's right. They're planning to intentionally do the one thing that spread the plutonium into the neighborhood in the first place. Now, the nearby town of Superior, Colorado, is not taking this lying down. Mayor Clint Folsom of Superior and other local officials have sent the unnamed dear manager. Couldn't they at least make a phone call and get a name? Anyway, they sent this dear manager letter laced with logic and common sense opposing any prescribed burns based on the potential for airborne radioactive contamination from the site. The mayor wrote, The potential harm that could be done if there were any radioactive material released far outweighs the benefit and suggested that there were other ways than a prescribed burn to achieve the same result. Personally, when it comes to invasive weeds, I'm fond of goats as weed control specialists. The burn is still scheduled for the spring of 2015, and given the speed at which the wheels of government turn, I don't suspect that the mayor and crew will get any response to their dear manager letter until midsummer 2016 at the earliest, at which point the burn will have already taken place. It's like the idiots in charge of the asylum can't wait until Every square inch of America is polluted with radionuclides and other toxic substances. Quite frankly, I'd rather have the invasive weeds than the invasive plutonium. And that's why U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, yuck, yuck, is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. By the way, if you haven't read Kristen Iverson's superb book, In the Shadow of Rocky Flats, I highly suggest it as both an excellent read and a chilling tale. 
A good article on how fracking is exposing people to radioactive waste is up on alternet.org and reads in part, The oil and gas drilling boom aided by the practice of fracking has unleashed some potentially scary radioactive stuff into our environment. The process can bring to the surface water that is laced with naturally occurring radioactive materials that were underground. But what happens when those quantities start increasing in the environment and getting into the water we drink, the fish we eat, and the soil in which our food grows? Great questions which need to be asked. We'll have a link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 182. Taking an international perspective... The United States has been described as the biggest obstacle to effectively carry out new proposals contained under the Convention on Nuclear Safety that seek to prevent a repeat of the March 11, 2011 meltdown of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. According to Reuters, the proposal from Europe had strongly maintained that nuclear operators have two burdens, prevent accidents and mitigate the effects of radioactive contamination in the event an accident does happen. Proposals have also been submitted that must force upgrades, possibly expensive ones, at existing or aging nuclear power plants. Sounds reasonable. Even Russia is amenable. But the U.S., according to this report, doesn't want the European proposal. Alison McFarlane, chair of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, said the proposal could all the more damage, her words, damage global nuclear safety because it's a, quote, difficult and long, time-consuming process. So because something takes a long time and is difficult, we're not going to do it, even though it's the right thing to do? This makes no sense. From Britain comes word that their nuclear reactors have been shut down 20 times a year because of faults, prompting fears over safety and the UK's energy supply. Fifteen reactors have had 62 unplanned shutdowns in the last three years. They've been hit by electrical, boiler, and valve defects, fires, storms, vibrations, and the discovery of tiny cracks. Missing so far are frogs, lice, locusts, flies, boils, and the death of the firstborn is under investigation. According to Edinburgh-based nuclear consultant Pete Roche, a major cause of shutdowns is the age of the reactors, which are more than 30 years old and past their sell-by dates. In a refreshing display of candor and common sense, Guy Crittenden, who has been editor of Hazmat Management Magazine and Solid Waste and Recycling, two trade publications, is retiring after 25 years and took the opportunity to write, The deteriorating status of things at the destroyed nuclear plant at Fukushima, Japan, means that you have an obligation, really, to be aware of the conditions there. The situation is exponentially more dire than Chernobyl. We're talking mass extinction around the world, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. That's one exit speech that will not be forgotten. Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin announced that Russia is willing to help India build more than 20 new nuclear power units following talks in Delhi with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Putin called it a new industry in India. No, It's the new arms race on the ground through reactors. And to learn more about Russian reactors and the way they are encroaching on that part of the world, listen to today's first interview coming up shortly. This news flash just in. If you're in the United States and near a Trader Joe's, for the holiday season they're offering Vermont cheddar cheese that's been aged six years. That's right. Pre-Fukushima cheese. If you have been avoiding dairy products for radiologic reasons, here's guilt-free cheddar that's not imported from New Zealand. Try to leave some for the rest of us. We'll have our featured interviews in just a moment, but first, John Stewart! I've already lit the Hanukkah candles tonight, 
But what I really want for this holiday season is a chance to show you how well nuclear issues will fit into the conscience-laden snark of The Daily Show. Let's grow this light metaphorically as well as physically and throw it on all things nuclear in 2015. We're counting on you, John. And by the way, Hag Sameach. As for the holidays for everyone else, if you're still not certain what to give that special someone, how about an ebook? Yes, I glow in the dark. One mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's the story of what it means to be one mile from the leaking nuclear reactor at Three Mile Island and how it led one woman to grow up to produce a weekly podcast on nuclear issues. Available on Amazon Kindle. Now for this week's interviews. Last week, on The Final Thought, I read part of an op-ed that really impressed me. It appeared in the Bangladesh newspaper, The Daily Star, and was written by a physics professor from Fordham University in New York. I found the comments in that editorial so compelling that I tracked the author down for this week's interview. Dr. Kumrul Hyder talks about his time at the Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, hotbeds of nuclear weapons research, as well as the implications, some might say the insanity, of a country as small as Bangladesh making plans to build a nuclear reactor. Please note that when Professor Hyder talks about radiation and his dangers, he is doing so from his perspective as a nuclear physicist, not as someone involved with public health and the epidemiology of exposure to radionuclides other than cesium and strontium. Kumrul Hyder, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much. Let's start out with giving people a sense of your academic background and training. I have a bachelor's degree in physics from uh, Dhaka University in Bangladesh. Then I came to the United States, obtained my master's in physics from University of Illinois in Chicago. And then I moved to Indiana University. I got my PhD from there in theoretical nuclear physics. After my PhD, I uh, worked for two years in a French university in uh, Quebec, Canada, And then I moved to Los Alamos National Lab, which is in New Mexico. This was the lab that was established uh, during the Second World War to develop the nuclear bomb. And after two and a half years at Los Alamos, I moved to Lawrence Livermore Lab, another weapons lab. And this lab was built in the early 50s, I guess, uh, to develop the hydrogen bomb, which is also known as the fusion bomb. And then after working one year at Livermore, I decided that I'm not going to work at, at these weapons factories anymore. So then I joined Forum in January of 1988 as a member of the physics department faculty. And you remain there and are a full professor at this point? Yeah. From January, my 28th year will start at Forum. Is your background nuclear physics? Yes. My background is nuclear physics. There's a difference between nuclear physics, nuclear reactors, and weapons research. I was doing pure academic work. Although at Livermore, my work was being funded by President Reagan's, you know, Star Wars program. But my work had nothing to do with strategic defense initiative because whatever work I did at uh, Livermore, they have been declassified and I got them published in peer-reviewed journals. Similarly, all the research work that I did at Los Alamos National Laboratory, all of them have been published in uh, open journals. Given that you worked at those two facilities and you've been involved in the academic world for so long, how has this led to your awareness of nuclear safety and radiation issues? During my stints at these two labs, particularly at Livermore, at Livermore I had an opportunity to meet Edward Teller, who's also known as the father of that fusion bomb, hydrogen bomb, and he was involved with the nuclear bomb also with Oppenheimer. Then I came to the conclusion that these guys are just out there to destroy the whole world. I mean, they're thinking. I mean, the way they think, I mean, they cannot think anything other than weapons. Any theory, new theory that comes out in physics, they try to think how to apply it to weapons. And I'll give you one example. In the late 80s, there was a thing called hot superconductor, high-temperature superconductor. A superconductor means when electricity flows through a conductor, if there is no loss, heat loss, then we say it's a superconductor. That means 100% transmission is taking place. For those of us who don't understand physics, what is the significance of that? Well, because if you can develop transmission lines using this kind of conductors, there will be no loss of power because we lost, there is a big loss of power when they're transmitted through transmission lines. Just because the 
cable gets heated. So if you can have a conductor where there will be no loss at all, energy that's produced at the power station, at the receiving station, 100% will be transmitted. The whole physics community was excited. This is something really great. There was a seminar arranged at Livermore Lab, and Taylor was going to be the speaker. So I thought maybe, I mean, he's a wise guy. Let me go and attend the seminar, see if he has any new theory about superconductor. Would you believe it was about 75 minutes he was talking about how to use these superconductors for space-based weapon system. I, I felt really disgusted after that. And I came I to the conclusion that this guy is basically like, like you know, Dr. Strangelove. And then the other reason is, you know, Star Wars. All of us who were working under Star Wars program, we knew that this was his Reagan's second term. So he's not going to run anymore. The new president is going to scrap the program. And then what will happen to us? I mean, this is soft money. We are out of jobs. So all of us started looking for faculty positions, which is more secure and long-term. And I'm glad that I got one at Fordham University. In your view, what's wrong with the way nuclear dangers have been represented to the general public? It's being represented by people who are involved with the nuclear power industry. Obviously, they're not going to say bad things about the machine with which they're working. They have to sell nuclear reactors to the power plants, and they have to convince people that it's safe, which, is, which isn't. Plus, the other thing, I think this is my personal opinion. We do research under grants. We get grants. And big companies like, you know, Honeywell, General Electric, I mean, the companies that make these big reactors, they have a lot of stake. I mean, they want to sell these reactors to power companies. And these companies, they also support research. I mean, so, for example, if someone is getting a grant from Honeywell, uh, he's not going to say anything against the reactors. Otherwise, Honeywell will stop the money. So there's money involved also here. Money is always a motivator. <laughs> but again, it's their personal belief also. Some of them believe that they're going to save the world. Plus, some of them believe that Russia was an evil empire. That's why the Star Wars came up, although it was entirely a hoax, because nothing came out of the Star Wars. It was just a bluff. How do you feel the public has been manipulated in its understanding of radiation, and what are some of the major misconceptions in their understanding as they've been told about it? Unless you're someone like me who has knowledge of nuclear physics, nuclear radiation, ordinary people know nothing about what kind of radiation comes out of a power plant. A nuclear power plant, I mean, first is it's not going to explode like an atom bomb because there are many layers of safeties. But you have seen what happened at Fukushima. Okay? In spite of all the safety features, it's exploded. And I'll explain why it exploded and why I consider reactors to be unsafe. During normal operation of a reactor, there is always slow leakage of radiation. And these are radioactive particles, the charged particles. When they enter your body, they ionize the body. Ionize means they remove electrons from the molecules of your body. That has genetic effect. That's why people get cancer from radiation. But you have to be exposed for a long, long time, unless it's like Chernobyl. Uh, people are still dying from radiation-related uh, disease in the area around Chernobyl. So that's why these people say nothing about the effects of radiation. They said nothing about the possibility of accidents. That's what bothers me. Let me tell you why... I took up this matter myself. I mean, I don't belong to any organized anti-nuclear movement. See, I'm from Bangladesh. When I saw that the Bangladesh government has signed a deal with one of the corrupt companies in Russia to set up a nuclear power plant in Bangladesh, I said, oh, my God, what, what, what are they doing? A country of 160 million people, 55,000 square mile. It's a delta. It gets flooded every year, and they're building a power plant there. In case of accident, how are they going to, I mean, around the power plant, probably there will be five, six million people staying. So I started asking the question, how will they evacuate so many people? Even if they evacuate, where are they going to transfer them? Uh, then I took an active, uh, myself, I mean, I started writing articles on the Daily Star, and I think you read only one, this uh, sixth horseman of the apocalypse. But before that, I wrote eight or nine more articles explaining everyone First is I try to explain the inside of a reactor so that people understand, I mean, what happens inside a reactor and what are the dangers. Then another article, I outlined the major accident, nuclear reactor accidents, because they say that it's safe. It's not safe. There have been 60, 70 accidents, but uh, about eight or nine major ones. Then I explained in one of my articles, I explained, I mean, what they're doing right now with nuclear waste. Okay? There is no solution to the problem of nuclear waste. Whatever we have, it's just like a Band-Aid treatment. United States, 
thought that they had a solution. They wanted to put all these uh, nuclear wastes under a mountain in Nevada, Yucca Mountain. And mm-hmm. then uh, geologists came and said that there's an uh, earthquake fault over there. And then they backed out. So still there is no permanent disposal system for this radioactive material. Because, you know, the reactor rod which contains the uranium, it has to be replaced after a certain amount of time when all the uranium is depleted. And it's full of radioactive material. And the most dangerous radioactive materials are the ones who have, we call them half-lives in the tens and hundreds. If the half-life is, let's say, five years, that means after five years, 50 of them are going to decay, giving off radiation. After another five years, another half, so that, that will be 25 will decay. It takes about 10 half lives for a nucleus to become safe. Now, nucleus which have half lives of the order of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, they're not very dangerous because the activity is very slow. The ones which half life of few hours, few days, they're also not dangerous because they become benign within a few days. It's the ones which have 10, 20, 30 years, 100 years because they're going to remain hot. Professor Heider used cesium as an example. The one which has a half-life of 30 years. Number looks small, but these guys are going to remain active for 300 years. You know, during the early days of nuclear tests, explosions were done in the Pacific. The radiation that was released, one of them is cesium, the other one is strontium, two of the most deadly radioactive nuclei. They're still floating around in the sky. Because both of them have, I don't know the exact number, but they'll remain there for another 200 years. There's no way you can get rid of them. I mean, people don't know these things. And I I thought that, let me explain to them. First is how a uh, reactor works. What are the chances of failure of a reactor? What happens when there is a failure of the reactor? What are the safety features you have? And then I explained, and why Fukushima exploded? Because whenever the safety mechanism shuts down, when it becomes, we say, supercritical, it shuts down automatically. But that means it stops the reaction inside the reactor. But the radioactive particles that are inside the reactor, they are still active. They are hot. So that the, inside the reactor is still heating up. There's a cooling system, and that is supposed to come into action as soon as the reactor stops. And at Fukushima, it didn't. There's a little, little time gap, and that small time gap is dangerous, and that's why everything exploded. Even if they say that it's 100%, I mean, Fukushima is an example that nothing is 100% safe. I'd like to put some attention on the articles that you have written. The editorial that I saw, the op-ed that I saw, was from a Bangladesh newspaper. Yeah, the Daily is, Star. The Daily right. Star. And is, I publish all my op-eds in Daily Star because I told you that I target my audience, Bangladeshi audience, because that's where the government is going to they think that they're going to build a, a nuclear power plant over there. And what distribution? Has there been any publication beyond the Bangladesh newspapers? They're not newspapers, but, I mean, these days you can find them on the net. Until this op-ed was picked up by a distributing service called enenews.com online, I don't know anyone who is aware of the writing that you have been doing. So this adds to the body of literature that we have that can break the information down into pieces that normal people who don't have a scientific background or an activist background can actually understand. All the articles that I wrote were not for experts. It's for uh, laymen who has no knowledge about uh, uh, reactors. What, if any, impact do you feel that you have had on the nuclear debate in Bangladesh? People are talking. I mean, uh, at least uh, people with certain background, educational background, they're talking. I mean, uh, uh, my friends tell me who are over there that you're basically uh, raising the awareness of the people over there. Do you feel that you've had any impact on the decision makers in Bangladesh? No, no. They're not going to deviate from their policy. Two reasons. One is these politicians, they don't understand what they're getting into. Second is corruption. And the Russian company that's going to build the nuclear reactor, that's one of the most corrupt company in Russia. And they always go to the seedy third world neighborhoods and uh, sell their ware reactors. Uh, basically, they share the money. And this reactor in Bangladesh, let me tell you, I don't foresee this power plant being built. Two billion dollars. You cannot even buy a reactor from a junkyard with two billion dollars. 
Minimum cost is about six to seven billion dollars, but that's in Western con- countries. In a country like Bangladesh, it has to be at least five billion dollars. And they're going to build with two billion dollars of 1,000 megawatt power plant. I'll salute them if you can do that. They're basically going to share the money, split the money among themselves. That's why they don't care what I write. But again, my article has effect only on people who read English newspapers. If I could have written it in a local language, which is Bangla, it would have had more you know, readers. But I'm not as fluent in Bangla as I'm in English, so that's why I have to write in English. Have you thought about having it translated so that it could be placed in the other newspapers? Well, I have to find a translator. I don't know whether anyone will be willing to do that. Well, you never know where nuclear hot seat is going to end up, so we may be able to find somebody for you. It's interesting that you said a little earlier that you have not been an anti-nuclear activist, but yet you sound like somebody who's being very active on the issue. Have you thought about moving forward in an activist way? Not really. I support them. I mean, I support them. I mean, uh, I talk with them. Uh, I'm not a member of any organization. But uh, they know that I'm anti-nuclear reactor. I'm not anti-nuclear physics because I myself am a nuclear physicist. Using nuclear science to build weapons of mass destruction, that I'm against that completely, totally. Are you aware that at the end of February and beginning of March, Dr. Helen Caldicott is holding a symposium in New York on nuclear weapons, and she is bringing together the experts of the world to discuss what the various issues are and what can be done about it? No, I'm not aware, but I'm sure I'll get uh, get an email from them. Listen, I'm not a world expert on nuclear reactors. I'm a nuclear physicist. I have taken it up on myself to make ordinary people who have no knowledge about nuclear reactors to give them some idea about what this beast is like and what it can do to them. If you could bring your awarenesses and the work that you have been doing to a higher level, who would you want to be made aware of it? The nuclear uh, reactor physicists or reactor engineers. And what would be your hope in doing so? Well, they should tell the people, I mean, what are the dangers involved in the business they're in? They don't tell it to the people. That's the problem. And one reason is, I mean, it's their bread and butter. I know you're not part of the anti-nuclear movement, but if you could have a conversation with somebody who is part of the movement or work with them on getting the information that you've put together out, is there anyone you have in mind that you would want to talk with or work with? Yeah, I have sorts of information. I get information from my friends. Uh, Since I worked at Los Alamos and Livermore, I have the reactor physics division over there. I have friends who work there. So if I have any questions, I ask them. And uh, they're very good at answering. My best source is, I mean, there's an environmental NGO based in Oslo, Norway. It's called Bellona Foundation. Bellona is an Italian name, B-E-L-L-O-N-A. Are you aware of that? No, I am not. Bellona Foundation, if you go to their website, you'll see, I mean, they basically deal with nuclear stuff. And the way they expose all these people. So I get a lot of information from them, and it's very reliable. Because they deal mostly with the nuclear stuff. I mean, nuclear reactor, nuclear power plants. And they have basically dissected the Russians and how unsafe the Russian reactors are. Russian reactors, I know how unsafe they are. I mean, even last year, in January alone, they had five accidents. Minor. But if you have minor accidents, if you don't shut it down immediately, it will become a major accident. But they don't report these things. Well, I got all this information from the Lona Foundation. When I was writing the article, nuclear accidents, so I just uh, wanted to find out. So I went there to the Lona Foundation and that all the information over there. They keep track of nuclear reactor business all over the world. Have you provided any information to them that they then find useful? They know everything about the Bangladesh reactor project. So, I mean, uh, they don't need any information from me. In fact, I need information from them if information is technical, highly technical. Otherwise, I don't need information from them because I know the basic things as a nuclear physicist. I know how these things work. In closing, is there anything that you wish to add? My audience is not people in the Western countries because they already know. I mean, there's a big group, there's a movement. They know about the danger. It's in the third world countries where there is no organized movement against nuclear power. And most of the people, I mean, I would say about 75% of the people don't know what nuclear power is.
That's why I write in those local newspapers, so that local people can read them. Professor Kumaral Hyder, thank you so much for the work that you are doing and for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Hi, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Nuclear physics professor Kumaral Hyder from Fordham University. We'll have a link to his op-ed piece, Likening Nuclear to the Sixth Horseman of the Apocalypse, up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Speaking of the apocalypse, our second interview is a timely revisit to Nuclear Hot Seat number 172 from October 7th of 2014. That was when I spoke with Dr. Helen Caldicott about many things, including her first public announcement of the upcoming symposium on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. I love how cheerful this show gets for the holidays. The press releases for that symposium are now out. Interest is growing and excitement as well. Here's what Dr. Caldicott had to say about the symposium on nuclear hot seat, about this landmark event which will take place February 28th and March 1st of 2015 at the New York Academy of Medicine. I understand from Molly that you are now organizing another symposium to take place early next year, early 2015, which is going to focus on nuclear weapons. Tell us what you can about it. So it's called The Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, and I'm doing this for three reasons. One, the administration has just announced that it will spend up to $1 trillion over the next 30 years replacing every single nuclear warhead, missile, ship, submarine, and plane to the tune of $1 trillion when Americans don't even have free health care. A. B. The situation in the Ukraine is very deleterious. For the first time since the Cold War, Russia and America are confronting each other militarily. And what people don't know is that they both have over a 1,000 hydrogen bombs in missiles on hair trigger alert that can be launched with a press of a button with a three-minute decision time by Putin or Obama. These situations are tenuous because we have been close to nuclear war on numerous occasions in the past. The yearly warning satellites have been set off by a rising moon or a flock of geese. Someone plugged a war games tape into the computer system and everyone was alerted thinking there was nuclear war and I could go on and on. A man called Eric Schlosser has just written a book called Command and Control documenting many of these near misses. So we're in a very serious situation and America's pushing Putin into a corner. Now Putin is probably a little paranoid and we know in medicine you don't threaten paranoid patients because they're likely to do something dangerous either to themselves or to you. That's the second thing and it's really extraordinary to me that the press is not covering this adequately. And the third thing is that recently over 70 officers in the missile silos in South Dakota and Colorado and the like, I flew over them yesterday actually, have been dismissed because they were taking drugs, they were cheating on their tests or they weren't well prepared for launching their weapons if they had to, which is of course within the life on earth. And also the chief officer of All these missile silos went to Russia recently and got drunk, cavorted with naughty women and did a lot of bad things and he's just been fired too. The computers at those missile silos uh, use floppy disks, if you can believe it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because Leslie Stahl did a thing on this on 60 Minutes recently, which is absolutely excellent. And also they have telephones that don't always work. There are two men in each missile silo, each armed with a pistol, one to shoot the other if one shows signs of deviant behavior, but it's very possible the deviant one could shoot the normal one. So things are very tenuous, and I think we're in a situation almost more dangerous now than we were at the height of the Cold War, and I helped to lead the nuclear weapons freeze movement in the 80s, simply because no one knows and no one is paying attention And I read recently that Putin has put his nuclear missiles on a higher than normal state of alert. And you may be sure STRATCOM has too. So I am actually addressing the National Press Club tomorrow at 3 o'clock if anyone wants to come about this issue with the Ukraine. And the Ukraine has 15 large nuclear power plants. 
Now, you really can't fight a conventional war in a country with nuclear reactors because one missile could cause a meltdown like Chernobyl, and Chernobyl is in the Ukraine. <laughs> and the Ukraine is still very radioactive, and a lot of people are getting cancer. So the whole thing is really ludicrous. Not just ludicrous, disastrous, because people don't know. Can you tell us any of the speakers who are already lined up for this new event next year? I actually can. Eric Schlosser, who wrote Command and Control. Seth Baum, who's going to talk about global catastrophic risk. Max Tegmark is a professor of physics at MIT. Oh, the other reason I'm holding it is I read an article in the Atlantic Monthly recently about artificial intelligence, and within 10 or 15 years, computers are going to be taking over almost everything that humans do, including planting crops, harvesting the crops, growing the food, everything. But Stephen Hawking and Max Tegmark and others who are doing this work are very concerned that, A, you can't program conscience or morality into computers, B, computers will be so intelligent they may be reproducing themselves, and C, there's a possibility they themselves could start a nuclear war. And that's why a part of the conference will be on artificial intelligence. Next, I've got Hans Christensen from the Federation of American Scientists, who will address the current size of the global nuclear arsenals. Bill Hartung will discuss the inordinate power and pathological dynamics exercised by U.S. military industrial complex. You know, when they started bombing ISIS, the stocks for Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and all the rest of the ugly killing firms went up. So that says everything. Greg Mello from the Los Alamos Study Institute, the role and funding of the nuclear weapons laboratories. John Pfeffer, Institute of Policy Studies, will compare the money spent on the U.S. military industrial complex compared with the paltry amount spent on the prevention of global warming. Bruce Gagnon, Global Network Against Weapons, will talk about ongoing and dangerous militarization of space. Bob Alvarez, who worked with Hazel Henderson in the DOE, will discuss lateral proliferation and describe how a small nuclear exchange could trigger a global holocaust. Alex Rosen, a, a doctor and international physician for the prevention of nuclear war, will describe the horrific medical implications of nuclear war. Holly Barker, who's an anthropologist, will describe the teratogenic and genetic pathology related to U.S. nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Alan Robock from Rutgers will outline his pioneering work on nuclear autumn and nuclear winter. He's a meteorologist. Lynn Eden, a wonderful woman, wrote a book called Whole World on Fire, discussing the huge subject ignored by the Pentagon, the effect of Holocaust firestorms following nuclear war. Jan Nolan, a brilliant woman from the Elliott School of International Affairs, will outline the underlying psychological pathology of the nuclear warriors. Mike Lofgren, anatomy of the deep state, will describe the underlying pathology of U.S. capitalism leading to this current tenuous nuclear situation. Susie Snyder from Pax Christie in the Netherlands will talk about a report they've just done called Don't Bank on the Bomb, all the banks involved in the development of nuclear weapons. Hugh Gustus, an anthropologist, will describe his anthropological research after spending a year at the Los Alamos Labs amongst the designers of nuclear weapons. Robert Shear, who I have to contact yet, was the author of Star Warriors, who research the young men who do the research on nuclear weapons development at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Noam Chomsky, you all know about Chomsky, will present the pathology within the present political system that could induce extinction. Tim Wright, who's the director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, will talk about what he's doing and then I will sum up the end of the symposium called An Urgent Prescription for Survival. That is a stunning lineup of individuals and content. When is this going to take place and where can people get information about how to participate? Okay, um, we're just putting up a new web page now at the Helen Caldicott Foundation dot org and it will be posted there. It will take place on February the twenty eighth and March the first, which is a weekend. 
in New York at the New York Academy of Medicine, the same place where I held the symposium last year on the Fukushima situation. That was Dr. Helen Caldicott talking about her upcoming symposium on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. The website to learn more and to register is at nuclearfreeplanet.org. We'll also have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 182. Activist shout-out. First, I want to single out the person who has done a great service to all of us and especially provided unflagging support in coming up with the material that is used in Nuclear Hot Seat every week. And that is the individual who created and runs enenews.com. I do have his first name, though I don't think everyone does, and so I will refrain from using it here. I don't even know if it's his real name. He is man o mystery and we've never even talked, let alone met. But this show would not be as thorough and rich as it is on its best weeks, or any of the others, without ENE News. Through its often obscurely sourced items and their links, I have discovered stories, interviewees, been kept up to date, and sometimes overly informed about all things anti-nuclear. And I have to say, it's been an honor and a kick those times when Nuclear Hot Seat makes it onto the site as a source for others to find. I believe ENE News is important enough to deserve more than a quick first mention in the research acknowledgments at the end of the show. So my gratitude to the site and to you, O oh Mr. ENE News, I must grant that you are one of my heroes. Other shout-outs to those who have supported this show in the past year in ways that are often invisible but makes them no less important. These people include, but are not limited to, Scott Portsline, Mimi German, Kimberly Roberson, Richard Viasana, Dr. Ulwin Pierre, Mindy Morrison, June Davidson, Craig Parker Adams and Winslow Court Studio, Marilee Weber and pianist John Barnard, and of course, all of my interviewees. I could not do the show without you. And if I have accidentally left off any names, please forgive me, gently remind me, and we'll start off the new year with a profound acknowledgement of your contributions. Here's today's final thought. I'm taking a bit of a break from the production of Nuclear Hot Seat, and so for the next two weeks, I will be running some of the best of programs. As we head into 2015, I am making plans to expand and deepen the coverage here on Nuclear Hot Seat. I want to travel to cover stories in person so I can pass along not just what I've read about events, but what I see, hear, and feel so that you get a real sense of what it's like to be there. My first goal in the new year is to get myself to Dr. Caldecott's symposium on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. How could I resist I want to bring you the voices, the excitement, the expertise, the feeling of being in community, the oddball observations, and the first-hand sense of being up close and personal with the leaders, movers, and shakers of our movement as we take a major step forward in our power and influence. I want to ask the unexpected questions and coax out the information that others in the media are too blind, lazy, or muffled to be able to share with their audience. As H.L. Mencken first said, I want to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable in this nuked-out, bizarro world we are living in. In order to do that, to get to the symposium and give you that quality of coverage, I'm going to need your help. There are several ways you can do this, and I'm not asking you to do anything that you can't do with an open heart. Now, Some of you already support this show by donating a small fixed amount every month. For those of you in the United States, it's the equivalent to the price of a cup of Starbucks and you leave the change behind for the barista. I'm deeply grateful to the regulars who have been giving me that donation. And I recently realized that if everyone listening to this show could make an auto payment of the equivalent of a Starbucks, about $5 a month, 
it would cover everything. The website expenses, especially someone to help me iron out the bugs left over from the hat last spring, plus provide me with the funds necessary to take this program and our message to the next level. But that's not the only way you can help. As regards Dr. Caldecott's symposium, maybe you have frequent flyer miles you can donate to get me a ticket. If you're in New York, maybe you can help me with transportation to and from the airport. I'll need a place to stay. A living room couch is just fine with me as long as there's public transportation nearby. Let's schedule a meetup, a brainstorming session, a Google Hangout. I promise I will learn the technology by then. Promise. We can talk about local strategies, media strategies, how Nuclear Hot Seat can best support you and your local movement. I want to make this show more interactive with its listenership so we can all have a part in making it happen. You may even have something in mind that is grander, wilder, and more profound than anything I can think of by myself. So please, bring it on. I may have been doing Nuclear Hot Seat virtually alone for three and a half years, but I can't keep it up at this pace without your support. So whatever you can do, whatever suggestions you have, whatever support you can give me for this program, please, I welcome you with open arms and a dollop of whipped cream on top. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, December 16, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Asahi Shimbun, Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority of Norway, latimes.com, veteranstoday.com, the town of Superior, Colorado, alternate.org, nuclear-news.net, newyorktimes.com, au.ibtimes.com, HaroldScotland.com, the pro-nuclear Grinches over at the World Nuclear Association and WorldNuclearNews.org, and the brilliant, compassionate, fair-minded, yet wickedly sarcastic members of the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which all of you are invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber. And a final song will be offered today in just a few moments. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts, or just check us out on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Our YouTube channel also carries the show, courtesy Joni Ray. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you, we have gotten to December Tis the season to remember all the friends and fun and family that makes the whole year great. So instead of overeating, I am offering this greeting to everyone, no matter how you choose to celebrate. Merry Hanukkah, Christa, Kwanzaa, Solstice, Ramamas. It's the holiday time of year. Hanukkah, Christa, Kwanzaa, Sosta, Ramamas. It's the season that brings good cheer. Be you Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim. If it's coming from love, it's true. Atheist, too. Hanukkah, Christa, Kwanzaa, Sosta, Ramamas. And Happy New Year to you. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat.